part three of our Spotlight on Sports Sociology with Dr. Jay Coakley as we wrap up another great conversation with our special guest from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. You know, I've suggested to a lot of these club programs that why have one sport for 12 months a year? Mm -hmm. Why not have multiple sport clubs where what you would do is play three to four different sports during the course of a year have them kinesiologically, you know, complementary in, in certain ways, but, uh, and then you would compete against other teams that were, that were other clubs that mm -hmm. were multiple sport clubs as well. And then you'd be developing uh, uh, physical literacy and you would be developing options for those kids as they get older. And then they may decide to specialize at 16 years old, which is which is the age at which they should be maybe starting to think about that choice mm -hmm. of specialization. But until then, to specialize, you're locking kids into a box that, that isn't gonna do them any favors developmentally mm -hmm. as a human being, yes. or athletically. At, at 13, I was at Nick Baltieri's Tennis Academy, and I played about nine hours a day, mm -hmm. and then I had a tutor for a couple, year, for a couple mm -hmm. hours. Yeah, that's real similar to Simone Biles, who when she was interviewed uh, during the last Olympics, she pointed out that she had never done a load of wash yeah. as a 20 year old. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, she had focused on sport to, to that extent that it really uh, made her developmentally challenged. And, uh, and, you know, unless she was talking gymnastics, she had a hard time. She didn't know what button to push on a washing machine in order to get her clothes clean. Yeah. Now, that's not development from my perspective as a parent or a yeah. grandparent. I bet you, I mean, there's people listening, though, that are thinking, well, if my child becomes Simone Biles and doesn't know how to use the washing machine, that'd be okay. Yeah, but 99% of those kids, 99.9, .9, don't become Simone Biles, and unless they know how to work that washing machine and do a heck of a lot of other things, they're going to be developmentally challenged as they enter adulthood. And what happens afterwards? Right. You're not, you're not in it. Tennis as an individual sport, I can compete with anyone. But what's outside of that? Right. You know, I mean, what, what types of conversations do you have to make friends? What right. kind of conversation, you know, if you're not talking about tennis? So it's, I think it's socially, it is a, a very different situation. And I was glad that Charlie was doing soccer because it's a team sport. Right. So I thought, oh, you know, that's different. Well, it's not really that yeah. different. It's a little different, but not that You're much. You're still competing and for spots. Right. So it, and as you get older, it gets much more competitive, but you're not an island like tennis. Right, yeah, and individual sports are especially problematic here because parents and coaches can isolate kids from their peers and from the rest of life more easily than you can in team sports. Mm -hmm. And so those kids in individual sports oftentimes get trapped uh, at an earlier age. And Chris Everett, I don't know if you remember this quote, she said, I stayed in tennis three years longer than I wanted to because I didn't know anything about the rest of the world. And I was, I was petrified about leaving the tennis court and having to be a regular human being. It's, it's terrifying. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, and Martina Navratilova said uh, when she retired, I'm going to go back to Paris and see the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower because I've been there 14 times yeah. and I've never seen the Louvre. Yeah. I've only seen the inside of hotel rooms. Now that's, you know, she was yeah. good and uh, we're talking about the exceptions here. 99.9% .9 don't get to be Chris Everett or Martina yeah. Navratilova or uh, uh, any of the other top Yeah. yeah. I still feel more comfortable in a hotel room than I do at home, though. Yeah, that's amazing. I yeah. mean, it's 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 kind of strange. I'm, I, that sounds awful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, I, I, I think about what a what a lack of opportunity to travel around the world, and now even in youth sports, at least connected. If if you think of coaching or sport or, or parenting as an educator, what a missed opportunity to go somewhere, right, and see something and make it part of a more well-rounded experience, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to be in you know, Colorado, go to visit the USOC. If you're going to be in D.C., go visit Holocaust or, or right. memorials. Mm -hmm. Go visit the sites. Right. You know, and make it a, a cultural, educational experience besides just your sporting experience. Right. There's and, no time and meet you people. have to practice. Yeah, and, you know, that's one of the things uh, that, I, that I tell coaches is that 
uh, one of the things you ought to be doing as a coach because sport can either expand our experiences, relationships, and identities, or they can constrict them. And we've developed a system where they're more likely to be constricted now. And to get away from that, what we ought to be doing as coaches is exactly what you've just said, Brian, is, is working with some people, people from the community, parents uh, of kids on your team, to set up those opportunities. When you go to Washington, D.C., not only go to that museum, but talk to the, the curator of that museum. Talk to somebody who set up one of the displays in the museum. Talk to one of the donors mm -hmm. that funded that museum. Then you're expanding uh, that individual's experiences and relationships and identities to the point where they're going to feel much more comfortable entering adulthood as an athlete because they have all of this mm -hmm. cushion to fall back on, these other identities. If they don't do well, yeah. this is not the end of the world. Uh, you know, and, and the coaches now who are doing the 18 to 20 year olds, the under 20s, you know, they're saying dealing with these kids emotionally is really tough because they haven't developed the identities and experiences that they can fall back on so that they're either at the top emotionally or at the bottom because whether they've been successful during practice or a game or had problems. And the coaches are saying, We've, we're on an emotional roller coaster with these kids. They don't have these identity cushions that, that kind of level them out, where they can take a loss, take a failure, mm -hmm. and not have it be the end of the world. Yeah. When, when children, I've noticed too, when I coached high school football down in Mississippi and coaching youth, youth soccer here with six-year-olds, the number of children crying after a loss or during the game, I find to be remarkable and disturbing that the children have affixed so much meaning to losing at such an early age yeah. that they are crying over that. I think the only time I cried as a child is, you know, a severe physical injury or when my mom died. And that kids are crying during sporting or immediately after a game yeah. seems to be uh, psychologically. Uh, Charlie has coaches that are upset if the kids aren't crying, like makes them run extra because they're not, they're not emotionally yeah. connected. I mean, that's just as disturbing. You see, you see that as connected as like a conformity? I know you've written about conformity and, and over conformity and those sorts of things. Is that kind of like ca carrying on that sport ethic? In that? Yeah, yeah. Kid, well, kids get get tied into this notion that they have to be dedicated to the, to the game above all else, that they've mm -hmm. got to make sacrifices in order to stay in the game, that there is nothing uh, that can stop them from pursuing their dreams in sport, uh, that they have to maintain through injury and pain. And, you know, that those are... You know, I, I want my I taught my kids those norms, but I also tried to teach them that there's limits to those norms, that you can go overboard, yeah. uh, that that when you have a pain, you know, you've got to learn to distinguish pain from injury and and know when to stop rather than playing through it all the time. And the same thing goes with your dedication to your sport. If it's going to interfere with other things that are important in your life, maybe you've got to start making some different kinds of choices. So if you get locked into that sport ethic and conforming to those norms without qualification, you end up engaging in some dangerous behaviors over time. Uh, and, and unfortunately, so a lot of coaches extol those behaviors where somebody is, is giving their body to the team, so to speak, despite the fact that they've just blown their ACL. We're seeing 10-year-olds now uh, at rates we've never seen before, going into orthopedic surgeries for torn ACLs, meniscus, uh, uh, MCLs. Uh, so the 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 uh, injuries that kids are having now, and we're getting off the topic a little bit, but but we're seeing injuries in kids that kids should not be having. Yeah. Well, this is why sociologists of sports uh, don't have elite level athletes. I'm too critical about everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a joke, and now we'll re revisit a different topic. Then. What what needs to happen? What do you think for coaching education to avoid the specialized uh, approach that coaches take? What, how, how do we actually go about reforming that? Because I'd say I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm optimistic about it. Uh, you know, what needs to happen? Yeah, yeah. There's there's uh, there's different things that you can do during practices, and and this requires that you meet with parents ahead of time, give them your philosophy on what you're doing during the course of the season. But if you're working with, say, 10-year-olds in soccer, 
uh, and, uh, and you have each of them bring a garbage can to the next practice because you're going to put 10 garbage cans around the field and you're going to have your players invent games with the balls and those garbage cans that they're going to play during, during part of your practice. And kids are then going to start uh, developing more accuracy on their kicks. They're going to develop different ways to see things while they're out on the field. Uh, they're going to be having fun laughing with each other. They're going to be learning without ever having a drill. And uh, so now that's just one little example. You know, we could brainstorm numerous other ways where, where you can change practices so that the kids are learning what you want them to learn, but they're having fun doing it. But you have to get parents on the same page mm -hmm. with you when you do that. And, uh, and it would be nice if you could get the other coaches in your league on the same page, and if we could get all the coaches in the country on the same page, but we don't have that kind of a system. Uh, and, and that's un unfortunate. It'd be nice if we could tie it together with certain kinds of coaching education, but we haven't done that uh, very effectively yeah. in the United States. Do you, do you see that happening, though? With, when you think about, right, we've, late, we're, we're in a certain period of history in the U.S. where things are very controlled, commercialized, uh, free market, and, and m the flow of money is moving around in all these professionalized kind of ways and, and quasi-professional ways. How does the system get reformed yeah. if it's not through legislation, regulation, degree programs, state requirements? Is, is, it, a, is it a pipe dream then? No, I think, well, you know, we're not going to have a revolution that's going to change something the revolution. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think Project Play has taken an incremental approach on that. Right, and, right, incremental, yeah. Yeah, and so what they do is they get the stakeholders looking at, at what's going on, and they're saying, wait a minute, we're spending all this money, and we're not getting what we're hoping we get. So if you can, in a community, get people to start realizing that, then they become much more open to change. If you're making sense to them, and... And Project Play has, has eight different plays that they use as guidelines. The USOC has the American Development Model, which USA Hockey developed because they were losing kids in their developmental programs to the point where their hockey programs in the Hockey Federation were in jeopardy. So what they did, and this took them a long time and they're still working through it, in the early 2000s they started working on developing this American development model, which emphasized small-sided play, physical literacy, uh, touches on the puck, you know, an absence of drills, more enjoyment, informal games, play on the ice, going skating sideways on the ice on four rinks rather than giving eight-year-olds a rink that adults would never play on if it was scaled in the same way for their size. And... Uh, it's saved on ice time. It's saved uh, on, on dropouts. And uh, as their developmental program started using the ADM approach, their development uh, signups went up 20% over what they were before they started dropping. But they're still having problems getting all the coaches on board with this. Because unless we go out and teach an eight-year-old how to hit and suck it up out on the ice, that uh, if we're just letting them have fun, we're wasting time. So, uh, so basically, it's still tough, but hockey has been successful uh, to a great extent, and now they're being used as a model for all the other 50 federations. But the IOC, I mean, not the IOC, the USOC is having a hard time yep. getting federations to buy into it because we've got such a vested interest in this control and command coach model. So one of the things that we like to do as we're, as we're wrapping up uh, this session is to have you tell us a little bit about a coach story that is kind of close to your heart. And I think you mentioned once uh, Coach Hall and, uh, and something that <laughs> that's yeah, memorable. I, yeah, I, I have a unique sport background in that I really never had a serious coach until I was a senior in high school because I had gone to another high school where there were no varsity sports. 
So, you know, I was part of a group that created uh, our own teams, played in leagues, were self-coached. We played 80 basketball games a year in the CYO and the Chicago Public Leagues and so on. But uh, when I got to high school, it was the first time I had a coach and, and I happened to do really well and got scholarships to offers to college. But my college coach was Joe B. Hall. And uh, Joe B. Hall uh, later went on to coach at Kentucky and win a national championship. He had been a player at Kentucky. And he used this control command model. And one of my stories about him is uh, during my sophomore year, we went out to California to play Loyola Marymount. We were playing a Division I kind of schedule. And, uh, and one of our players had an uncle who was working at Disney, uh, Disneyland, and he got us all tickets to Disneyland the, the day of our game. Oh. Yeah. And we went to Disneyland <laughs> for about six hours oh. during that day. And then we went and had our pregame meal. And then we went to the gym and take a nap and, and got, <laughs> got ready for the game. And, and we were supposed to be neck and neck with Loyola Marymount. And we were down like 15 points in, in the start of the second quarter. And, and Hall yelled at us and said, you know, we were still at Disneyland and we better yeah, get out of yeah. Disneyland. And we lost big time. We got on an airplane at uh, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night, flew from L.A. to Denver, got off the plane at 2, 2.30. He told us to keep on our dress clothes. That was when you had to dress in blazers and dress clothes and so on. We went back to the, the gym. Uh, he opened up the handball courts, and we ran walls yep. in our tennis shoes and our basketball shoes and and our dress clothes until the floors were so slippery with sweat and vomit oh. that we oh. couldn't get from one wall to the next. And then he told us that we should never forget that experience. And I never have. Yes. Yeah. Sounds like it. And uh, learn your lesson. And and I, I we learned our lesson. From <laughs> Keep our heads out of Disneyland and yeah. get them into the game. But. Uh, but that was part of the way coaches approached things. And, and I'm thinking that uh, that's probably not the way to get people to love running. <laughs> no, not to love running. <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up our conversation with Dr. Jay Coakley, sports sociologist from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Let us know what you think and make sure to check out the show notes for any and all references made during the episode. Don't miss next week's Sport Report episodes on the reason sport coaching is not a profession. And of course, our next special guest Saturday when we sit down with Carlton Creech, Vice Chancellor of Athletics for the University of Denver. See you next time. <laughs>